Good afternoon, and thanks so much for joining us here on 9 News Plus today. We're sitting down with anchor Kyle Clark to chat about two interviews that he did with candidates in the upcoming midterm elections. Joe O'Day is running for a Senate seat as a Republican, and he spoke with Kyle in a sit-down interview, the first interview that Joe O'Day has done with 9 News since launching his campaign about 11 months ago. Meanwhile, Democratic State Representative Leslie Herod is running for mayor of Denver. The outspoken champion of progressive causes also spoke with Kyle earlier this month. So, Kyle, I want to start by asking you about your interview. First off, we're going to ask you about Joe Day, yeah. uh, the Republican senatorial candidate who you had a chance to sit down with last week. What were your initial impressions of your interview with him? I mean, he's a regular guy. I mean, he hasn't been in politics before. He hasn't run for anything. When you ask him questions, you can tell he's actually processing the question as opposed mm -hmm. to just identifying the topic and then getting ready to spew the talking point. I'm sure that sometimes is to the chagrin of his handlers and campaign who would prefer that he stay on a message. Uh, he's been dinged a bit for a position moving around on this issue or that, in particular abortion. Um, I get the sense it's really because he's thinking about this stuff deeply for the first time in his life. Not that he hasn't had ideas or he's been unprincipled, but the specificity with which you have to outline a position to run for office versus just being an average Joe uh, is different. And I think what we're seeing is somebody who's grappling with the nuances of these issues for the first time. What did you sense about his personality? You mentioned he kind of comes across as a bit of an average Joe, no pun intended there. Yeah. What was your sense of his personality overall? I mean, he, he strikes me as somebody who's the boss. I mean, he's a wealthy guy. He runs a business. People listen to him. Um, you know, when you push back, uh, sometimes he seems incredulous. That's not an uncommon thing to find from politicians, especially those who have been in executive leadership before. Um, they often find themselves to be very convincing on a number of topics. So uh, he, he wasn't rude at any point during the interview, but you can tell this is a guy who's used to running things. All right. So there you go. Uh, Policy-wise, any... Yeah. Big takeaways, you said he moved around, he's or he has moved around on some issues, maybe revisiting things for the first time. Anything that stuck out to you policy-wise from your interview? The biggest thing for me, I think, is he's trying to claim this mantle of being a moderate Republican. That, of course, is an inexact term. What does that mean? It means different things to different people. He thinks it's advantageous if he describes himself as a moderate Republican. Uh, Democrats were happy to label him as a moderate to try and get the more extreme Republican to win during the primary. We talk about that meddling if you want to. Now they're trying to say he's not moderate, he's more extreme. Uh, so I was really interested in how he defines his, his moderate Republicanism. Where would he break with Mitch McConnell if Mitch McConnell was running the Senate? He couldn't give me an answer. Which of Mitch McConnell's priorities would you block because they're too conservative? Well, if he tried to put a total ban I would block that. Uh, there's a lot of things that I would block. I, I've, I've stood apart from the Republican Party here. I was the very first one that came out and said that, you know, Trump, the big lie, that was false. Uh, he's not our president. Biden's our president. I, I said that. I've said that several times. So there's a lot of places where I bucked the party. Let's explore a couple more of those beyond abortion and beyond Trump's election lies. What other priorities of Mitch McConnell would you pull a Joe Manchin on and move to the center? Well, if, we, if we're going to close, secure the border, I would make sure that we included citizenship for the Dreamers. That's probably not something that's on a high priority for Republicans, but it is for me. And those are the kind of things that I would look at, something that, uh, you know, benefits Colorado. That position is identical with Mitch McConnell's, though. Mitch McConnell said, secure the borders and deal with the Dreamers at the same time. That, I mean, you're in lockstep with him on that. So I'm trying to figure out, where exactly do you disagree with Mitch McConnell other than abortion? Because, you know, he opposes Trump's big lie as, as well. So I'm trying to figure out, where's the distance between you guys? You know what I'm saying? Well, there's a lot of things that we probably do agree on. I'm a conservative. Um, and, and I believe, um, you know, in fiscal conservancy. And so those are things that are aligned with the Republican Party. I'm more of a social libertarian. Um, I believe same-sex marriage. I believe in contraception. I believe in, in, in an abortion law that promotes the first five months being the decision of a woman. And so those are the things that I've thought through. Like, he literally could not give me an answer of, of a policy priority that Republicans are pushing that he would block or something that Democrats are pushing that Republicans are blocking that he would join the Democrats to get through. So he says he's a moderate Republican, and he does disagree with the party on abortion. Uh, he disagrees with some in the party on same-sex marriage. But when it comes to, like, the big things that are percolating in Congress right now, he seems like a pretty standard Mitch McConnell Republican. Uh, for all the talk about how he wants to be a Republican Joe Manchin, you don't see a lot of policy positions that suggest here's somebody who would really gum up the works for Republicans if he's part of a Republican majority. I, I guess to be 
to be fair, perhaps to him, this may be an argument that O'Day's people would make is that he does acknowledge that Joe Biden won the 2020 election fairly, yep. which in this day and age does qualify perhaps more towards the center than, uh, what would you that's make a, of that? Well, that's a good question. I mean, does, does disputing a lie make somebody moderate? Look, the, anybody that turns to violence should be held accountable. I, I believe that. There's no room in our country for violence. Elections are how we keep our democracy moving forward. I believe in our election system. I came out right away uh, when I started my campaign. I was down in Cortez, one of my very first events uh, down there, and, and we had 20 people in the room. And, and I, I was asked the question of whether or not uh, Trump was our president. And, and I said, no, Biden's our president. He's a lousy president. I had five people in the room get up and leave the room. It didn't, it didn't dissuade me. I've been on that mission. I believe that's false. I believe we have a good election system, and, and that's what I believe in. You know, that's kind of a tough thing. I mean, so I think about it. So Congressman Ken Buck from Colorado does not support the big lie. That dude's not, that dude's not moderate. He, he would, he'd, be, he'd be blazing mad if you called him moderate. He's a very conservative Republican. He just doesn't buy the big lie. So I get the idea that the big lie has kind of become a, a litmus test, but to equate that with whether you're moderate or conservative, that's just kind of like a true false thing to me. Okay. So... From that, and I know you just alluded to this, but I'll still ask the question anyways. Yeah. Do you suspect that if he were elected that Joe O'Day would be more along the lines of a Cory Gardner? Or would he be more of a thorn in Republican leadership a la Lisa Murkowski, Susan Collins, Mitt Romney? I don't see any sign that he would be more of a true centrist Republican in the, along the lines of Collins, Murkowski, Romney, uh, who is holding up legislation, that kind of thing. He seems very similar to Cory Gardner and the fact that he is, he's very affable, he's very friendly, he doesn't talk in doctrinaire tones, but the idea that he's going to go to Washington and vote against Mitch McConnell, I think if he was going to do that, he'd be able to list a couple of places where he was going to do that by now because that's kind of his whole brand. I, I take it when he tells me, I'm a conservative guy, I believe him. You know, when I asked him, where might you break with Mitch McConnell? He goes, oh, I don't know. I mean, I'm a pretty conservative guy. I took that to mean like I might be to the right of Mitch McConnell on some things. And I kind of get the sense that, that he might be. He might be to the left of McConnell on some things, to the right of him on other things, but generally in alignment. So I think kind of very much like a Cory Gardner. He doesn't strike me as somebody who comes in and says, I have a very defined political philosophy on which I must be satiated or I will hold this up. I'll allow Joe Manchin or Susan Collins sometimes. All right, um, any final thoughts, takeaways from your interview from Joe Day? I, I think if anything comes out of that interview that he probably wishes he had back was his question about how he's looking to strike a deal that brings balance to women's rights. Heard from a lot of women after that who did not care for that. Hmm. Uh, I, that's not a phrase I've heard from him before. It was striking to hear him say that. Um, I don't doubt that that's what he believes, uh, but I think that that's, likely a phrase that we're going to hear again and again and again in the campaign. All right, so that'll do it for Joe Day. I want to turn our attention to your other kind of big interview that you had, with, which was with Leslie Herod, who announced that she's formally running for the Denver mayoral office. Um, tell us your initial takeaways from your interview with her. Um, obviously, a, a Democrat and uh, joining a pretty crowded list now of Democrats running for, for mayor. Yeah, and, and she's definitely the most progressive front runner in the race. There's a group of three women, Kelly Bruff, who used to run the chamber, Debbie Ortega, longtime city councilwoman, kind of centrist Democrat, and now Leslie Herod. And she's definitely the most far left of the three. She is decidedly progressive. She's staunch progressive. The thing that I took away from that interview was how determined she is to try and tack to the center and emphasize centrist credentials and bipartisan policy making because she knows that she's going to be painted as a far leftist. I mean, the fact, she is who she is. She's a progressive. That's what she stands for. She's, she stood for a lot of progressive things. But at the same time, she can point to places in the state legislature where she's taken progressive ideas, like police reform, found the right moment, like the summer of 2020, and gotten big bipartisan support for them. So what do you, how do you judge that? Is that, a par, is that a partisan progressive win? Is that a bipartisan win? She'll tell you it's a bipartisan win. I'm sure she'll raise money on it as a progressive win. You know what I mean? Yeah, I guess anything else that told you that, yes, she is progressive based on what she's done in the past, but she's trying to tack towards the center now? 
I mean, she's been she's been very critical of law enforcement in Colorado. She straight up called the Aurora Police Department racist, uh, which I should note, a court agreed with her and put that department under a consent decree to uh, reform their practices. But I've noticed she's been generally critical of law enforcement in a lot of different ways, and she's been a leader on police reform. So I asked her about DPD and where she sees DPD these days, whether she thinks that's a racist department, what their level of reform is, is needed. And she talked about how she feels like she's seen movement from DPD in a positive direction. She would not describe them as a racist department. Um, and that, to me, felt like a bit of a departure from some of the rhetoric of the past, not necessarily a position change, but a, a, a tonal change, perhaps. Rent control, another big mm -hmm. issue that you discussed. What were your takeaways based on what she has viewed in the past on rent or said in the past about rent control and what she said in your interview? You know, I think rent control is interesting. I think it's become a very divisive uh, phrase or slogan, if you will, like we've seen so many others. But there are things about um, ensuring that we're stabilizing the cost of housing that actually work and are great ideas. But we want to make sure that we're not doing is incentivizing people to stay in rent controlled housing so that new people can't come in, new families can't come in. So what we're looking at is how Denver can grow with its people. Housing is number one priority in that. Um, so we have to make sure that we're not creating situations or policies that make Denver remain stagnant. And so what I think we need to do is make sure we have middle income housing opportunities for folks who really need it. Uh, we need low income housing, but truly low income housing. And we need attainable housing. Not everybody wants to live in a single family home, but not everybody wants to live in a 700 square foot apartment for $2,000 either. We need to make sure that we have the spectrum available for folks. So rent control is something that's been talked up a lot at the state legislature, but it really is kind of dead on arrival because Governor Polis doesn't like it. There was a scaled down rent control bill that moved along in the legislature that was going to get pared down to just mobile home parks, and, and the governor was still expressing concern about that. The situation in Colorado is that cities, with a few limited exceptions in terms of, I believe it refers to affordable housing or city-owned property, can't do rent control on their own. There's a state ban. I think it came about in the mid-80s. They would need the state to lift the state ban before cities could do rent control. So my question to her was, you can't do this on your own as mayor of Denver or even with the support of council, but you could be a big voice on this if you wanted to say rent control would help Denver. Mayor Michael Hancock spoke have been opposed to rent control. I think she said, she told me rent control is interesting and then proceeded to make the argument against rent control that basically you don't want to have a situation where people are frozen in amber in units and never move through and that uh, it's not used as a tool for mobility to come in and out. She may have uh, alluded to the fact that in some cities that have instituted rent control, it lowers the amount of rental units in the city because there's less of an incentive to be a landlord and that could provide a, a housing crunch in Denver. Uh, but I, I thought that that was a very kind of like swing to the middle type of answer, which is like, oh, rent control, which a lot of progressive lo uh, progressives love. It's interesting, but let me tell you what's wrong with it. What do, you, what do you take away from that? I took away from that that she's not going to make it a priority. If she were to be elected and she chose to make it a priority, to me, that would be a significant shift from where we're seeing her now. Speaking of tacting towards the center, yeah. she had a pretty interesting answer when you compared her to perhaps being the most progressive mayoral candidate on a record. Uh, tell us more about that answer, and I, kn I know that struck a chord with you a bit. Yeah, you know, I, I don't know. There are some questions that I'll go into an interview really excited about because I genuinely want to know somebody's answer. You know, there's some questions we ask because we want to get them on the record, you know, so that everybody can know. And then there's some questions that I just, I've got no idea what they're going to say, but I want to know what they're going to say. So I, I asked her, Will you be the first progressive mayor of Denver? Which sounds like a question about her, but she smartly knew it's actually a question about all of the previous mayors of Denver uh, who are very much alive <laughs> and will be listening and may be involved in this race. Do you think that you would be the first progressive mayor of Denver if elected? I don't think I would be the first progressive mayor of Denver, no. I think a lot of uh, Denver mayors came in with new, fresh ideas. Uh, and quite frankly, I think we have a history of great mayors in the city. I look at at Mayor Webb, Mayor Pena, all the things that they have done, Hickenlooper, all the great things that they have done for this city. Uh, and I believe that they were progressive for the time, you know. She caught that it was actually a question about the previous mayors of Denver, because she's clearly progressive. The question is, were previous mayors of Denver progressive? And again, she kind of threaded the needle. You know, she's no newbie. She gets this. She threaded the needle by saying that a number of Denver's previous mayors have had progressive ideas for their time 
or progressive policies when they came into office. And she talked about something that uh, Mayor Pena did. She talked about some of the shoe leather work that Wellington Webb did. She talked about John Hickenlooper coming out of nowhere as a business owner and some of his progressive ideas. And she name checked the three of them did not name check Mayor Hancock, uh, the current mayor, who progressives really don't care for. And I asked her, was that intentional? And then, ooh, whoops, Daisy, I, sh I should have listed him too. She said, she said, well, I'd list him. And I think the nuance that she gave that was, she said, he had some progressive ideas when he came into office. And then the pandemic happened. Mm. I'm pretty sure, I, I, I'm, I'm bad with dates. I, I think he came into office in 2013 and I'm pretty sure the pandemic was actually 2020. <laughs> so to me, that was her most slippery answer where she was trying not to directly shade the mayor, but let's just say he did not need sunglasses because she was pretty clear that, well, he came into office with some progressive ideas, but then seven years later, a pandemic happened and they never came to fruition. All right, well, I guess with that overlook aside, how did you view her personality and how that might translate to the campaign trail? She's a known quantity in Denver, and in, in Democratic circles, she's a known quantity. She's at everything. Uh, she's at everything, she's involved in everything. Um, to me, she's always been a very interesting character in Colorado politics in the sense that here's somebody who has very, very progressive values, but is not in the wing of progressivism that is simply constantly flaming centrist Democrats, you know? And there's some people who do that and they move the needle that way by just constantly being a thorn in the side of centrist Democrats. And she's always struck me as somebody who has ideals, but wants to get deals done. Mm. You know, she's, she disagrees with the governor on a lot, but she's not out browbeating him in public. She disagrees with Mayor Hancock on a bunch of stuff. But as she pointed out to me, I've endorsed him. She did endorse him when he had more progressive people running against him. You know, um, uh, Diana DeGette, longtime congresswoman from Denver, is not the most progressive voice in, in Congress. And for years, progressives have been champing at the bit that maybe somebody should primary her or run against her. Could have been somebody like Leslie Harrod. But instead, she's always got her back. Uh, so she's somebody who I think has, has positioned herself for years between the progressive and the centrist wings of, of Democrats. But there's no doubt. She's on, she's on the left wing when it comes to, to Democrats, but at the end of the day, she's not looking to just publicly excoriate people. She's looking to get her, get her deals done however she can. Well, you mentioned she's a known quantity. Yeah. Uh, she's a known quantity because she's a state representative and she's running for mayor. How is that going to work between her being a state representative and running for mayor? How does that work with, for example, uh, lobbyist donations yep. as well as just overall? So she says she can do it both at the same time. And she told me, I'm a multitasker. I've done it before. I have been in the state legislature. I've been a community leader. I've worked in nonprofits at the same time. I can walk and chew gum uh, at the same time. Uh, now, in the past, I want to say it was maybe 1993 when uh, State Senator Penfield Tate ran for Denver mayor for the first time. He stepped down from the state Senate. He was not up for election in November. He was in between runs. She is up for election in November. She'll win easily. It's a Democratic district. Uh, but Penfield Tate told me, I didn't feel like I could properly serve my constituents and also run for mayor at hmm. the same time. So he said, that's the reason why I stepped away. She says, I'm going to do both. The thing you keep in mind is she's not just some also rans state legislator. She's a very powerful player at the Capitol uh, who's in the middle of the biggest discussions. So it's not like she's just going to be sitting on a back bench and voting yay or nay all day and then going out in the evening to campaign for mayor. So she's going to have a very significant legislative role while she, current, while she runs for mayor. Uh, and, you know, so obviously the legislative term starts in January. Mayoral election is in the spring. So they're going to be right on top of each other. She's going to do both at the same time. One question that came up ethically is when the state legislative session is going on January on, legislators can't take money from lobbyists. So they can't have a lobbyist in their office saying, please vote this way on a bill, and oh, here's a thousand bucks for your reelection. Not allowed during the session. You got to do it outside session. Yay, ethics. Um, <laughs> but with her running for mayor, she's going to have a separate bucket of money for running for mayor, and there isn't anything legally stopping her from taking lobbyist money in the mayor bucket while she's in the legislature. That could clearly be problematic, at least in terms of appearances. The day that she announced, we asked her to clarify on that in terms of what she's going to do, and she committed she will not take prohibited lobbyist money on the mayoral side. At the same time, it can't go into the legislative bucket. So we'll be watching to see that she keeps that promise. All right, so that's obviously one big thing to watch for. Anything else, anything else that 
stood out to you from your interview with her that we haven't touched on yet? I, I think she's going to be a formidable force in, in the race for mayor. I think uh, you know, Kelly Bruff is going to have outside interest spending a tremendous amount of money to get her elected, the business community and that kind of thing. I, I think it remains to be seen what uh, Deb Ortega's constituency looks like. The feeling that I got from her announcement was a lot of respect from people in democratic circles that dominate Denver politics, but not necessarily a parade of people lining up behind her. Mm. Herod literally had a parade of people lining up behind her at events the following week. Uh, and, and Kelly Bruff remains to be seen in terms of what kind of constituency she has, but she'll have lots of money behind her campaign to convince people that she's the right choice. Um, so at this point, those three women are, are the people to watch. Somebody else will get into it. I think, as I might have accidentally said on air, you know some white man will have the confidence to get in. Um, so it just it remains to be seen how many of them. Uh, but there's a really good chance that Denver's going to have its first female heir because you got three you got three powerful women who each have a story to tell who are in the race, and uh, you have to call the three of them the front runners at this point. Stunning to me that it's 2022 and Denver's not had a female mayor, but that, as you mentioned, may change here. Well, in 2023. But uh, Kyle, thanks for your time and your insight on both those uh, great interviews you did last week. Yeah, yeah, happy to hang out. Thanks, Kyle.